Thank you. Would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning. You are good. You are great. Thank you for your spirit that is already at work in our lives. Pray that not one person would see me, but you, in Jesus' name. Please give me what to say and how to say it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the text before us this morning is Psalm 117. And this is the shortest chapter in the book of Psalm. It is also the shortest chapter in the entire Bible. Interesting to note is that the Bible has 1,189 chapters. And Psalm 117 is the middle chapter of the entire Bible. It is the 5, 595th chapter. Now, this psalm talks about three things. It talks about the love of God, the steadfastness of God, and the faithfulness of God. For today, I want to narrow on the faithfulness of God. And I want to do three things. The first is I want to quickly explore what it means to be faithful. And the second is I want to point out three areas in my personal life that I have seen the faithfulness of God. And the third, I want to give anyone here or watching to respond to God's faithfulness. Now, if I ask you to define faithfulness, what would you say? Or if I ask you to take a quick scroll through your phone or through your mind, your contacts, and think of one or two people that you deem as faithful, who would they be? The word faithfulness stems from the same Hebrew word from which we get our English word amen or amen. It is the Hebrew word emuna, which means let it be so, stable, permanent. However, the Hebrew word translated in this psalm is the word emeth, which sometimes is translated as truth or faithfulness. But either way, it means the same thing because God is true to his promises. So when we say someone is faithful, we mean someone who is stable, someone who is reliable, someone who is dependable, someone who is trustworthy, someone you can rely, depend, and trust, and stake your life on, someone who would not turn his or her back on you when it matters most. And that is why this morning I present to you Jesus Christ as the only faithful, trustworthy, and dependable person you can stake your life on. Why do I say that? The first is that I have experienced his physical protection in my own life. Standing before you this morning is a living miracle. I was born out of wedlock. My mom had me when she was in high school years. My father died when I was four months old. My grandfather wanted my mother to abort. She was afraid. She denied. My grandmother denied. Eventually, I was born with my mother and my grandmom. And I grew up with nothing. Along the line, my mother died. My grandmother died. But I was selling on the streets of Accra. We call it street hawking. You balance things on your head, and you sell in the busy traffic. And it can be very, very dangerous. You can take a guess. I have sold detergents. I have sold bathing soap. I have sold plantain, banana, fruit, clothing, ice creams. I was a walking Walmart. There are few things in this room I cannot balance on my head. 
But that it came one evening when I was selling after school. In the busy traffic of Accra called Kaneshi First Line, it connects three regions. But I had to sell that night so that I could have something for school the next day. And you have three lanes, two middle lanes, and another three lanes. And I was selling on the first three lanes. It was late. And a truck driver mistakenly missed, lost control over his wheels. And the truck ran into me. It threw me from the third street from to the fifth street. People came yelling, he's dead. Everybody thought I was dead. They rushed to me. For some reason, which I now know is God, no vehicle was on that busy road for 30 seconds, at least. My head did not hit the ground. I was selling ice cream that night. My ice cream box, everything got broken. I was overwhelmed. People wanted to take me to the hospital. I said, just leave me alone. I picked my boss. I went through the crowd, and I went home. More than once, I have experienced people trying to kidnap me. Once I was actually thinking, and a man walked to me and told me, what are you doing here? Take your slippers and leave. I took my, I was selling plantain that day. I remember very well, I took my pan of plantain, my slippers, I walked. No one said anything. Jesus is able to protect and keep us safe. But the second is his redemptive power. You see, I grew up with nothing, and I know some of you don't, cannot understand, because even if your parents are not there, the food and the money still comes. And I grew up thinking I was, I could do some things, but I don't remember once being called at school or at church to do anything. I always felt the teachers and the pastors were favoring the, the rich kids. So I grew up with envy, bitterness, trying to prove that I could do things. But Jesus saved me. And as I stand here, there are some things I don't allow in my life. And envy is one of those things. I appreciate what other people have, but I don't envy what anybody has. I have come to see that Jesus is that father that I have always wanted but never had. He loves me. He's accepted me the way I am. I don't have to prove myself to anyone. And yet how many times we try to prove ourselves so we can be accepted by people? Jesus accepts you the way you are. But the third is his provision. There is no way I should be in waiting in the United States today. If anyone had told me that I would go to college, that would have been the very sign that that person was either a false prophet or a false prophetess. I would have had need of no other evidence. If you know where I come from, there is no way I should have gone through college. Even high school was a struggle. But I say to the glory of God, I have finished my Master of Science in Belgium. I finished my Master's here. This can only be the provision of God. I have no anxiety or fear about the future. He has kept me till this time. He is able to keep me. And he has kept you till this time. He is able to keep you. We forget that today was yesterday's tomorrow. When we were afraid of the future, it included today. Here we are experiencing God's faithfulness. But our text this morning is very clear. It says, praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us all. This is not just for me. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible said that here, O Israel, the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God. He keeps his covenant, he keeps his promises, and he keeps his steadfast love to a thousand generations. Not a thousand years, a thousand. Theologians purge one generation to 40 years. God's faithfulness is a thousand times four. But this text is even more exciting. It says that God's faithfulness is forever. 
First John chapter 1, verse 9, it says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First Peter chapter 4, verse 19, it says that if anyone suffers according to God's will, he or she should entrust themselves into the hands of the faithful God. The road has not always been smooth. I have had challenges, I've had temptations, but thank God for his faithfulness. First Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has ever taken any human except that which is common to us. God is faithful. He is able to keep us from being tempted. And even when we are tempted, he is able to make a way for us to be able to stand up under it. And this is why I want to weigh in a little bit into this whole issue of racialization, racism, racial injustice, inequality, and all the issues in the earth. Jesus is the only one whom we need to fix our eyes on. And many of you listening to me this morning here, I've spoken with you. You've told me, some of you, the only reason you came to Wheaton and choose Wheaton over other very good schools is not just because of the program you are studying, but because of the Christ attached to the program. Please don't lose that. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your mind be confused. Don't be swayed. Keep your focus, keep your eyes on Jesus. You see, if we fix our eyes on unity and unity, we end up a division. If we fix our eyes on light, light, we end up in darkness. We all. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, on Jesus, and on Jesus alone, at the cross, we find unity. And in his resurrection, we find light in this dark world. Don't lose Jesus. Don't lose the focus. And I want to conclude with a prayer and offer you the invitation. Maybe you are doubting your faith and trust in Jesus. I want you to consider staking your life on Jesus, trusting in Jesus, putting your faith in him as the only God who is able to redeem, protect, provide and keep you through the end of your life. Would you please pray with me? Father, we pray. You are the faithful God. The only faithful God. The only one we can trust and depend and look up to. I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning that you would help us to be able to put our faith and our trust in you and in you alone. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that our hearts will not be moved, that our minds will not be swayed, but that we will keep our focus on Christ. And Lord, together with my brothers and sisters, we pray for this campus, Lord. I pray that Jesus will be the focus and the center forever and ever. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that when friends meet for fellowship, for eating on Blanchard Law, that Jesus will be the center. That when people stand in queue waiting to take their food at Saga, they will share their commonness, they will share their identity, they will talk about their experience in Jesus. That, Lord, from the apartments of Terrace right to the dorms of Fisher, that roommates and friends will talk about Jesus. Let Jesus be the talk on our lips. Let Jesus fill the air. Let Jesus fill the airwaves. Let Jesus fill our, our classroom. Let Jesus fill this whole campus. In Jesus' name we pray. Let it be so. Amen.